there, Gail Price. Hello, Scott Nell. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, the first thing I remember about you is when we got together to eat, you were talking about you like the dirty, nasty, complicated cases. Like the more complicated, it's like you, you just like to bite your teeth into it because you're extremely seasoned. Um, you've got a, just lots and lots of experience. You know, you have great resources. And so you want to use those for your clients. Well, yeah, I like something with meat on the bones, speaking mm -hmm. of eating. You know, I like something to dig my teeth into and um, something that's interesting. And mm -hmm. usually it's the either more complicated or dirty or whatever properties that are more interesting to me. There's more for me to do. And yes, I have lots of experts I work with and I've worked with over the years and and I bring a lot of experience to a problem. So mm -hmm. I like to use that. Well, that makes you invaluable. Hey, so one of the, so you have an emphasis, but I'd like to hear what else you, you would like to share, but you have an emphasis on what commercial real estate. That's, that's a big focus of yours, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I've been in real estate for like 47 years and there's really nothing that I haven't done. Mm -hmm. I am a broker and I've been practicing real estate law for almost 30 years so over the years, I've, you know, I have accumulated a lot of uh, practical experience as well mm -hmm. as, uh, I hope, a little knowledge. Mm -hmm. so Definitely. I started and you've working. probably been in some pretty crazy situations, too. Some hellish situations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Halloween's coming up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, yes. it's, it's perfect for the show. And so tell us, uh, give, give, uh, give us an example of uh, a situation that was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. Well, let's see. Um, uh, like I said, notwithstanding that I specialize in commercial property, I've uh, mm -hmm. worked in residential as well. Mm -hmm. uh, weirdest thing that was ever left behind in a house was a casket. <sighs> Now, I need to ask, who brings their own casket to a funeral? Mm -hmm. I mean, is somebody looking for a discount on funeral services <laughs> if they bring their own? And before you ask, I didn't open it. I don't need that bad mojo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just locked it in the garage and walked away. My gosh. Did it startle you? Well, yeah, it is a little unnerving to see a casket positioned right in the middle of a single car garage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was um, it was silver with blue trim. <laughs> uh -huh. Did you ever did anyone ever look in it? Did you ever find out what was in there? Or you just you walked no. away and said, no, I'm done. no, I'm not opening this. I'm mm -hmm. not opening this. I don't know. I mean, some perv could have slept in it. Who knows? <laughs> no, right. no. Um, I have, I have stories from from my days in in uh, when I was predominantly selling, and not. Uh, I started as an appraiser, so really? I. That I didn't know. I've yeah, I've been in thousands of houses over the years, and uh, I've done construction inspection. Um, most unfortunate construction inspection was during an El Nino year when my lender mm -hmm. asked me to go out and uh, inspect the framing for, you know, next phase of distribution of loan proceeds. And the framing was all uh, disconnected from the foundations and down the street because the El Nino rains had washed it all down. Um Everything that you can imagine that could happen to somebody appraising has happened to me. Being mm -hmm. chased, being, um, you know, cornered, um, uh, all kinds of, but, but best appraisal was the estate of General George S. Patton. Most what? ever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, we got to hear about that. The estate is in San Marino. It's much reduced in acreage over the years, obviously. Mm -hmm. The general's grandfather was a 
sort of consulate, if you will, to the indigenous population in the late 1800s. And the general's mother mm -hmm. uh, was that man's daughter. So it's the family estate. And it was the first house west of the Mississippi to have a, its own elevator. And mm -hmm. it was the most fabulous, refined, thought through property I've ever been in. You know, um, all the the hardware, for example, on the mm -hmm. first floor was all polished brass, but on the residential floors, they were all hand painted porcelain. And uh -huh. when I went to the property, the basement, which was a full basement, like a, a daylight walkout basement, um, was full of things uh, belonging to the general, the safes that he had in France. Uh, oh, wow. French wines in the wine mm -hmm. cellar, um, Marlin that the general had caught off Florida. It was just a kind of a time capsule. Like and, a museum. And the gardener present on the estate when I went there showed me everything. And he was the grandson of the original gardener on the original estate. Oh my so God. he knew <laughs> everything. He just came with the property and he knew everything. So that was so really fun. How, how does that, how do you put a value on the, for lack of a better word, the celebrity of the property? Well, you do have to look for, it's very difficult, but you do have to look for other celebrity properties. Especially historical like that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they are few and far between. And uh, in my case, working for a lender at the time, it was ultimately going to be up to the lender to determine what they would loan against the appraisal, not so much what the value of the mm -hmm. property really was. But I've, I've appraised a lot of historical right. or celebrity properties, lots in the Hollywood Hills and that area. Mm -hmm. There was a property that was architecturally and historically significant. And mm -hmm. it was moved because of that, it was moved to the backside of sort of Studio City, the backside of the hills when the Hollywood Bowl was built in order to mm -hmm. save it. And it was the house was placed on a double lot. And on the lot is, I assume it's still there, the Cahuenga hanging tree. Because this really? was right next to the Cahuenga Pass, and they used to string up old outlaws from this beautiful sort of horizontally growing sycamore. And, uh, you know, if you took anyone to the property, they would always ask if any old outlaws were hanging around. And God mm -hmm. forbid uh, the owner would be present because she mm -hmm. was want to answer that question. Uh -huh. And throughout the house, it was full of her various types of occult paraphernalia. You know, mm -hmm. um, black candles in the cupboard, a crystal ball on the coffee table, a clock face of hieroglyphics, uh, just all sorts of paraphernalia all over the house. Like she was trying to make something work, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, by day, she was doing her internship in psychiatry at one of our most esteemed uh, medical universities in Southern California. Uh huh. So she had this kind of dark, sordid background that people probably didn't even know about. Yes, I'm sure that was the case. And uh, I don't think she, at least not in my um, involvement for a few years, did she ever sell that property? Because you just can't go around telling people that ghosts are still hanging around the <laughs> hanging tree. <laughs> wow. Go. Wow. And so that's at the, uh, at the, which side of the Hollywood Hills? It would be on the west side of the freeway, the 101 mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. Gosh, we, we, we do business there all the time. The stories we hear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what else? Tell, tell, give me something in the commercial world. What, 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 what has there been that's been like a really crazy situation for you? Well, I had a client... <clears throat> as a buyer who uh, wanted a essentially a warehouse 
but um, it was it fronted a major commercial thoroughfare. Mm -hmm. The property was half in the county of Los Angeles, half in the city of Los Angeles. On the northern border were working um, oil tanks, uh, oil pumps, excuse me. Mm -hmm. To the rear of the property was a tank farm uh, on the right on the other side of the train tracks. Mm -hmm. To the south of the property was a uh, gas station and covering the property like like veins or roads on a map were easements. Mm -hmm. All manner of access easements to the tank farm or to the oil pumps or whatever. When and you say a tank farm, what does that mean? A, a large piece of dirt populated by oil storage tanks okay good you know in my mind because we were just talking about general Patton, i was thinking you know <laughs> i was thinking what is she talking about okay so go on so well, but because so, that's this one sounds really complicated um it was and there is um by the way a tiffany window at a church in san marino with the general popping up out of a Sherman tank mm -hmm. in the Tiffany window in a church. <laughs> Too much fun. But anyway, this, see that. this other property, um, I did a lot of investigation on the title. I was able to uh, talk to the owner's son, and I found out a lot about the property that the title company did not find. I found easements the title company did not find. So representing the buyer, I didn't tell the title company about those easements. They have to insure my client. But uh, I brought in soils engineers and other environmental engineers, and we thoroughly scoured that property and ended up uh, with a clean property, and we bought it. Wow, because that's it sounds like just one of those problems could have put a stop to the whole deal, but you had like a whole handful. Yeah, I had a similar property in uh, in an area adjacent to the North Valley Plume, an identified mm -hmm. area of contamination. And it was uh, such that I was able to obtain environmental insurance for my buyer on that property. And we were able to close that deal. So there's usually a way to work through problems unless it's just a full-on Superfund site, in which case there are still ways to work through those problems. Right. I assume when you have the Superfund sites that it's probably a lot of release of liability for whoever's selling, I would guess. Well, there's only so much uh, liability you can release under federal statute and state statute. Okay. You know, if you're part of the problem, as it were, then you're part of the cleanup. However, um, I have a property right now in the Gardena area that is a Superfund site, and mm -hmm. uh, the buyer is making it part of a large, much larger assemblage of mm -hmm. properties and willing to do the cleanup mm -hmm. to make this larger assemblage work and, and then obviously ensuing development. Right, right. Well, your job sounds a lot more interesting than mine. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Actually, it was interesting. I sold this property. Actually, it was a probate, and I represented the buyer. And these two just lovely gentlemen that um, I was so happy that they chose me to be their agent because I just thought they were charming and smart and lovely. They are, they're like the only guys that would have ever, ever gotten this particular property. It was a property for an, like an old time actress and you walk into it, it felt like a museum as well. Mm -hmm. And when you walk in, if you look closely, it's like, wait, is that, is, is that an urn? Those are, <laughs> those are ashes up there. You know, it's reminiscent of your story earlier. And mm -hmm. then there's a picture of the dad without a shirt like this. I'm going like, that's the picture? The dad with the stomach sticking out up on there. <laughs> and I was going like, wow, that's interesting. And then you walk, I walk around this bar area and it looks like there's a body back there. It totally startled me. Turns out it's a dummy. And I'm thinking like, why would you keep that in a dark room? 
Well, it's because of the response that they got. Mm -hmm. There so probably the, was a hidden camera somewhere. Oh, it was so funny. And I kept on thinking, now, guys, you realize there's going to be a lot of work because of X, Y, Z, but we're going to get it at a good price because of that. Mm -hmm. And, man, these guys, very, very creative types, really had a vision for it. And now I'm seeing pictures come over, and I'm going, what? Now you guys have like a, I think it's just like, is it two acres? Like a two acre estate with multiple lot, multiple um, APNs. Mm -hmm. So I said, before you do anything, why don't you go ahead and make some lot line adjustments for how things could be down the road in the event you guys decide to move out of the country, move out of state, or you want to sell a property? I said, this one move will probably could, could potentially make you hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. But you have to plan now. Don't start doing a bunch of stuff and then doing it later. Do it now. Yes. So I connected them with an expediter and the right people, and sure enough, they're doing it. So it turns out the deal they made is much better than they thought it was because now they're seeing, look at all the all the possibilities. So there's like a lot up top where there was a there was a warehouse. Well, guess what? It's going to have a private driveway all the way up, with, and that's going to be the view property. Well, and you I'm can sure the former owner sitting on the mantelpiece was very pleased. Yes, yes. <laughs> they liked it. They, I think the comments to me recently were, well, we like one of the ghosts because that ghost has a great spirit, but the other ghost, we don't like her at all. So we're going to have to do something to get rid of her. <laughs> <laughs> what? Are we really having this conversation? And they're, they're really serious. Like, like you know, we're, we're totally good with so-and-so. She's awesome. Yeah. Well, so. well, in the spirit of Halloween, there are you know, reminders we have to give our clients. You have mm -hmm. to disclose a death occurring in the property for three years. If yeah. it's murder, you have to disclose it for 10 years. And there's nothing in the statute about ghosts. But if you're asked a direct question, you right. are not, you as a broker are not permitted to lie. Right. Now, right. If you don't, no, you don't know. But I, I actually had litigation over failure to disclose a death in property. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people are mm, more concerned about that sort of thing than you might imagine. What was interesting is that I've had that come up multiple times when I do a lot of estates. And I always you know, have to ask that question. Um, and... Um, I, they said, well, it was over three years, so I don't have to disclose it. And I said, let me just say this. Yeah, according according to the letter of the law, yes. But I think the better thing to do is just tell people that way, because why you, you're going to you're going to have an argument over something that they're going to they're going to think it's one way and they're going to be passionate mm -hmm. about it because it's a big thing to them. And it's not to you, but I would definitely do it. So whenever someone says, you know, should I disclose? I said, you don't even need, need to finish that sentence. So the answer is yes. Yeah. Just do it. Well, you don't very, you don't yeah. have to if there's a little crack or a scratch or something don't worry about that i mean we're not going to spend you know to have 100 pages but we uh, we also do inspections ahead of time so there's sewer line termite home and so that when we have when we go into escrow they've seen everything that we have and i'm saying everyone is fine when they're not surprised not everyone but most people and if it's mm -hmm. and why would you want to sell the house to someone that could come back at you and do something like I, I, to me it's kind of like why even do that for, on so many levels? And so well, you're it hasn't wise. been a problem yet. You're wise. And it's not worth it. It's better to just disclose. Unless um, the former occupant had HIV or AIDS, and then you do not disclose that. Right. Right. As you know. Uh, um, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but it, it raises the issue of what is material? What is a material fact to a buyer? Mm -hmm. It's based on a reasonable person standard, but uh -huh. you know, fundamentally, it's somewhat subjective. So yeah. uh, best to disclose everything so that it's not your determination of what's material to a buyer. I totally agree. And uh, I mean, but recently it was interesting because on a deal that I was working on, someone said um, that they, they, they thought there was an issue with X, Y, Z. And since I'm not going to mention too much. And so I said it to the trustee and the trustee said, well, to the best of my knowledge, this, this, and this. And I said, okay. So we said to the other side in writing, to the best of her knowledge, this, this, and this, you know, but buyer to verify. 
And their contention was, well, we didn't disclose. And I was like, holy crap. What we're doing is we are disclosing. And then, so it was just interesting. So the point is, in my experience, if people want to fight, they want to F you, they're going to F you. Mm -hmm. That they want to. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. That's why I think over-disclosing is, is definitely the ticket. I, I agree. I have a case right now where I'm defending a, a, construct, a contractor, mm -hmm. um, and they disclosed everything, and they're being sued. They're just being sued. We disclose we don't have a survey. So I'm going right. to sue you for encroachment. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we disclose to you we don't have a survey. Go get a survey. You need a survey. And I you have chose a not to get one. story. Yeah. I, I can give you a survey story if you want. Yeah, I, let's do that. That's one of the that's one of the biggest uh, biggest issues, right? It's non-disclosure and probably lot lines and everything. There are so many disputes over boundary lines. And it's so unnecessary. People just don't get surveys when they buy. And they should absolutely must, must, must get a survey. But further to that, in in any kind of hillside area, it just should be mandatory. It, it's malpractice not to advise your client to get a survey. So I had a client with an, both an architecturally significant and a piece of property and uh, that client was a master gardener. So the three acres of that property were just Shangri-La, just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. New buyer next door. Uh, and the client had been there 40 years. Uh, so new buyer next door gets a survey and says, you got to move your fence because you're encroaching on the, the other property. And uh, not by a little, but by a lot including uh, taking out part of uh, the client's deck, uh, a sycamore tree, fencing, and the client's beloved pet cemetery. Ooh. To which new buyer said, who cares about a bunch of damn dead dogs? And then World War III ensued. Mm -hmm. Um. So had, uh, you know, had everybody had surveys, at least, you know, they could have mitigated uh, the problem. But I did, we went to court and we were in trial when I was able to settle it, uh -huh. without, you know, prior to a judgment, I was able to settle by uh, use of a, of a license. A license agreement. So okay, so t tell me what that is. It's a right to use the property of another. There we go. But it is completely revocable, and it doesn't vest any rights in the licensee. So, for Clever. example, maybe you go into a mall and you see a little cart in the middle of the walkway selling sunglasses. They're probably there on a license, and they okay. can be. That license can be revoked. It can be repositioned, moved at any time. Mm -hmm. So what I negotiated in that particular, the you know, pet cemetery case, was uh, an, a non-revocable license but conditioned. So for as long as my client owns the property and occupies it full time, she can't sell it. She can't move out into senior living. She can't rent it. But right. as long as she owns and occupies it, the fence and the pet cemetery stay where they are. Mm -hmm. But as soon as she wants to sell it, then the neighbor retakes the property. And if you think this only happens in hillside areas, uh, it happens in the flats, too. Sure. Another property of mine, client remodeled. And the it was in county, Pasadena Post Office, County of Los Angeles uh, territory, mm -hmm. and the county gave them a, all the permits and a certificate of occupancy on the remodel. And then the neighbor, this was in the flats, got a survey and said, you know, fence is in the wrong place, and I'm tearing it down. Mm -hmm. and tore down the fence, replaced it on the lot line, and then the client's remodel was now encroaching into the side setbacks and over 
uh, portions over the fence line. And so even though the county had finaled that remodel, the county made him tear out that portion of the remodel that was then encroaching. That is a nightmare. But why why would they do something like for the remodel and everything and then but but not do a survey? You would think that they would that would be like an obvious thing to do, especially if you're gonna be expanding it all. That's just nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I don't look to spend, I don't know, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars without first spending maybe a couple thousand on a survey. Yeah. I That's agree. Well, ridiculous. The best advice you can give your clients is to get a survey. Right, right. And and I would say one other thing about that. Uh, yeah. From a quality of life standpoint, the worst things in the world for homeowners particularly are to take their their home, their sanctuary, their uh, you know sacred space and turn it into a nightmare because they now are at war with their neighbor. Right. And and it it just doesn't make sense to do that. It is more taxing, more um, emotionally draining than anything that a homeowner could experience. Well, it's you know, especially, you know, it's, it's where you come home to, which is, it's like when there was something going on with a neighbor to, you know, in, in our home, I, I remember coming home and being so uncomfortable with the fact that it, this was happening. Turned out that the the mom was lovely, lovely, lovely. And so it all got worked out. But, you know, you have a you have a son who's difficult and unstable. But that's that's a, Yeah, I felt so uncomfortable. And it wasn't about any money. It was about my home. Mm hmm. It's yeah, your, most, totally agree. It's your sanctuary. So yeah, uh, it is uh, anything you can do before you buy that property to avoid problems later is money well spent. So Gail, we're back on. I would love to hear about something that's really important to you at some charities and costs. Okay. Um, in 2016, well, before I tell you what it is, I just want your listeners to close their eyes and picture a veteran. Mm -hmm. Got it in your mind? Okay. Okay. 90% of you will have pictured a man. Hmm. And in 2016, I established the uh, Pasadena City College Women Veterans Scholarship Fund. Mm -hmm. um, Community colleges will, uh, throughout California have veteran centers and PCCs is about the largest. Um, but women veterans have unique mm, burdens, everything mm -hmm. from children uh, to, you know, trying to go to school at night, uh, right. You know, and uh, they need additional help. And so I established the Women Veterans Scholarship Fund. I In order it. to make it women only, I had to put it through a private organization. So I went mm -hmm. to the Pasadena chapter of the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And they happened to be populated by several uh, veterans themselves, and they were very anxious to become involved in it. So every year since 2016, we've given scholarships uh, every fall and spring semester. And uh, we can make a real difference because 12 units at a community college is about 600 bucks. That's awesome. And so we, um, you know, uh, we do everything from just straight tuition to money for books. Sometimes it's money for uh, licensing. I had a Navy veteran who was an electrician, and when she uh, got out into civilian life, she took all the coursework at PCC to mm -hmm. get her electrician's license, and she had to do um, an internship with a licensed electrician, but she didn't have the equipment, the safety equipment for mm -hmm. it. And so she used our scholarship funds for that. So That's awesome. 
Um, and, you know, veterans returning for retraining um, also face challenges because veterans educational benefits, VA benefits, can be transferred to a child. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, women did that and then needed to go back to school for retraining and found that they didn't have any VA benefits. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect.